Welcome back, legends. I hope you're all fantastic. It is time for another installment of Friday Q&A. As always, thank you all so much for this week's questions. An extra special thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Boss, and their new range of instrument cables, which I will talk about a little bit later in the video. Again, as usual, if you have questions you would like me to answer on next week's Q&A video, please put them in the comment section below. If you want to support the channel directly, there are some links in the video description, including links to some free impulse responses and the Discord server where you can come and hang out. So let's get straight into this week's questions. I did a video with the new Fractal Audio Full Res IRs last week, and I got a few questions about that. Uh, specifically, is the full res approach superior to using reverb? And this kind of ties in to really talking about convolution reverb versus algorithmic reverb. And there's lots of differing opinions on this. One thing you cannot get with convolution reverb in particular is any modulation happening on the reverb. And in that regard, a lot of people consider algorithmic reverb kind of superior to that. But with the full res IRs in particular, what I like about that is a lot of the time people just want to have more of an amp in the room vibe, you want some kind of room simulation. And if you're not familiar with how to dial that in using reverb, just loading up some full res IRs will get you that in a real kind of quick and convenient method. So that's why I've liked using those. I've also been liking just loading convolution reverbs like gated reverbs onto my Axe effects as well, which is a really fun way to do that. I did a video with that during the week as well. If you want to check that out. Alrighty, how I checked out Bruce Bouillet's Order of Control album. Uh, very briefly, I feel like I listened to that maybe 10 or so years ago, if that's the one I'm thinking of, or I could be thinking of something else. But I have listened a lot to his band with John Karabi, The Scream. That is a cult classic. If you can find that Scream album, uh, have a listen to it. There are some slamming songs on there, and it's Bruce just off the chain uh, playing amazing like high voltage blues rock guitar, kind of in the style of like Doug Aldrich and Zach, Zach Wilde and just Bruce Bouillet. Bruce is like the underrated superhero in Racer X. So uh, yeah, he's somebody I would love to see play live in the flesh because I just love the intensity he plays with. The same reason I love Paul Gilbert. Paul and Bruce were, you know, one of the ultimate guitar duos of all time. But I should go and check out that Order of Control album uh, because I feel like I listened to something by Bruce, but I can't remember what it is. So this weekend, I'm going to put some Bruce Bouillet on my, well, I was going to say <laughs> on my CD player, but I don't listen to CDs on, unless I'm in the car. On my headphones, I'm going to do that. All right, next question. Uh, have I ever considered getting my wife on for a segment, kind of like Ola England and his wife do? Uh, do you people want to hear that? Maybe we could do something like I could teach my wife to play some guitar or something like that each week. That might be interesting. Who is my favorite mathematician of all time? When I was studying, I would have given you a totally different answer. But uh, now that I'm kind of old and jaded, I think the uh, thing that a lot of people, when they like get into maths and science, are really uh, kind of sucked in by that lure of like the, the inimitable genius. And uh, that's something I've kind of really cooled on at the moment because I think a lot of the time, the reality is when there's any kind of advances in human thought, uh, that whole like, great man of history thing kind of doesn't hold up when you actually start looking at a more nuanced view of things. And mathematics in particular is best when it's really collaborative. And a great example of that would be Paul Edish. Uh, you know, he's like the great collaborator of mathematics, uh, wrote and collaborated with like an insane amount of people. He's a really, really interesting character as well. And uh, yeah, he's got some some kind of interesting philo philosophical stuff as well. Uh, somebody else who uh, I really find interesting as a character is uh, Everest Galois, 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 Galois. That's how you say it. I'm, I'm getting rusty on this. Uh, yeah, brilliant, brilliant mathematician, uh, basically like invented a few whole new fields. And uh, uh, as I think a lot of young men did at the time, died in a duel uh, in some kind of strange love triangle or something like that. So yeah, Galois was an interesting character. But I think in terms of just mathematicians, uh, probably Richard P. Feynman, even though he's probably better known as a 
physicist, the Feynman lectures and his biography are just essential reading for anybody who's vaguely interested in science. And I love the fact that he was such a great communicator and such a great teacher, as well as being uh, so good at the actual nuts and bolts of doing things. And uh, yeah, there was there were so many other kind of people in that entire era who did so much amazing work. And again, there was such a collaborative aspect, but uh, Feynman kind of sticks out to me as a really interesting character who did some really, really great and useful work. All right, next question. Have I ever had an inexpensive guitar that I like more than my expensive guitars? I'm gonna say the one that immediately comes to mind is my PV Wolfgang Special. I got it secondhand. I did not pay a lot of money for it and I just got it because I wanted a Wolfgang and it's Eddie, you know what I mean? And uh, as I'm recording this particular video, it's actually the one year anniversary of his death, which I still can't believe that feels like yesterday that I heard about that. But um, yeah, the little Wolfgang special, you know, it's not the top of the line guitar or anything like that, but it absolutely rips. It's like one of the ultimate rock and roll guitars that I've ever played. It's really easy to play. It sounds great. I've got it totally stock. Well, all I did was I took off the, uh, you know, the, the bolts that you used to connect the locking nut because I never use the Floyd on it. And it just works. Every time I've played that guitar live, I've been so amazed at just how well it holds up to all my other instruments. So uh, yeah, I would love to hear from all of you. What's your what's your like kind of, I don't know, maybe cult classic or hidden gem guitar that you didn't pay a lot of money for that just kind of blows away some maybe better spec or more expensive guitars out there? Let me know. Uh, have I ever tried the Red Bear app? No, but it kind of uh, kind of sounds interesting based on the description. Something about Gibson and something about it being manufactured in Russia or the Soviet Union sounds, uh, kind of sounds interesting. I wonder if electroharmonics had anything to do with that. I've played a MIG before and that is a really, really cool amp for the just kind of JCM 800 style thing. So yeah, that is, uh, that is one I've not heard of and one I should definitely check out. Looping. This is a big question. This is actually something that I've plan to do a series of videos on. And after the whole craziness of this weekend is over, I'm down at the Western Australian Guitar Festival. I'll probably be down there by the time this particular video goes live. Uh, I will do some stuff on looping because just how to do loops, uh, I think is a really overlooked thing. Like operating a looper is one thing, coming up with ideas, getting inspiration and using it as a practice tool. I think uh, a looper is such a great utility tool. And I think when you can use one, you assume that everybody knows how to use one. So I will kind of throw some ideas together. Again, let me know what you would all like to hear from when it comes uh, from looping or operating looping or coming up with ideas and things like that. Uh, let me know in the comment section below. That will give me some, uh, some good direction. And maybe over the next month, I will start leaking out a few little videos on looping. All right, before we go any further, it's time to hear from our sponsor for this week's video. Today's video is sponsored by Boss and their new range of instrument cables. Boss sent me out some of their cables to try out and there's three in particular that I've been enjoying. Their premium instrument cable that you can see right here is probably the nicest cable that I've ever owned. I've been using it in the studio. Every single video you have heard over the last month, I've been plugging my guitars in with this and it lives up to the name premium. There's beautiful braiding on there. There's beautiful 24 karat gold connectors and it is constructed really well out of oxygen free copper cabling. At the same time, there's these slimline pancake jack connectors for really tight pedal connections, which feature the same tips and the same cabling in there. And I've been using their long standard guitar cable to plug my guitars in live for all the ragdoll shows we've been doing. As you would expect from Boss, these all feel really high quality and ready to gig. Furthermore, they come with a lifetime guarantee from Boss. So if you want to learn more about these particular cables and you want to help support the channel, check the links in the video description and you can grab one for yourself. Again, a massive thank you to Boss for sponsoring this video. Now that I've got the FM9, will I still be using the FM3 for gigs? I actually used the FM3 last weekend. I had to do an acoustic show and for what I use 
on acoustic guitar processing, like, you know, plugging in a piezo equipped acoustic guitar, uh, the FM3 is perfect because a lot of the time I just need a little bit of compression and EQ and maybe a touch of reverb. I don't need app modeling or anything like that. And I might need like a slightly louder scene and I might need the looper. And using it for an acoustic gig like that was fantastic. I really enjoyed that particular setup. So it's going to get a lot more use for that particular setup. And then any fly dates that I do, Ragdoll have a bunch of shows in December booked where we're flying up to mine sites. I'm going to be using the FM3 again, just because it's slightly more compact. I can take it as carry on. And we have a residency coming up this month, uh, which starts next Wednesday, again, at convenience in Perth. And I think what I'm going to do is probably uh, bring both units and then maybe alternating nights, I will just compare them and kind of do a side by side. I could even do it in between sets, have the same preset and just kind of see what I like better. That might actually make for a kind of interesting video, like how it changes how I play and change sounds on the fly and things like that. That would be, that would be an interesting one, I think. Let me know if you'd all like to hear something along those lines. Kinman pickups, not to be confused with Kingman, Brett Kingman, his amazing YouTube channel. He has demoed some Kinman pickups. Uh, I've actually, I actually don't have any guitars with Kinman pickups in them, but if, again, if you're all interested in hearing me play some, I will get some, I will get my hands on some. And Chris Kinman is, uh, he's kind of one of those characters out there who is just, it seems like some people can't help but innovate and they're always looking to improve what they do. And I've heard some other guitars that other people own that I've played with Kinman pickups and uh, I've always been impressed by the way they sound. So, uh, and, and they're Australian. So, you know, why don't I have some Kinman pickups in any of my guitars? I should totally make that happen. So keep your ears and eyes peeled for that one over the next couple of months. Uh, have I ever used a fret wrap? Uh, yeah, I have used a fret wrap. I have it on my main live guitar, which is just up there. I don't really use it for the tapping or anything like that. I just put it behind the strings so that it kind of mutes the dead string length on there so that if I want to do really percussive muted stuff with a gate, uh, there's nothing ringing out behind there triggering the gate or anything like that. So. Yeah, I just kind of use that because then I don't have to stuff foam under there or anything like that. Uh, and I do, uh, you know, from time to time, if I'm playing my seven string, I'm doing tap stuff. I will slap the fret wrap on there just just cause it's a thing to do. You know what I mean? They get a bad rap, the old, the old fret wrap, but uh, they are again, a handy utility tool. Alrighty, we've got a few more questions for this week's video. Again, if you've got questions for next week, put them in the comment section below. Under the radar guitar players, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, put a player up, uh, I think, from each of the main eras of guitar. So let's think of an under the radar player. I'm gonna say the 60s, even though most of his best work was in the 70s. I'm gonna go with Robin Trower. If you love Hendrix, Trower flies under the radar a little bit. Uh, Bridge of Size, again, I think it came in in 73 or 74, but uh, Robin was in Prockle Horum in the 60s. And uh, Bridge of Size is one of my favorite albums of all time. And his vibrato and his tone and James Jawar's singing and just everything about it. If I could go back in time and be in a band, I would almost just wanna be Robin Trower in that Bridge of Size band because that album just takes my breath away. And uh, a lot of his work around then is similarly Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to give you another really, really underrated player from the 70s, Frank Marino. Go and listen to some Frank Marino because uh, especially his ma Mahogany Rush stuff, the way he just plays, the fire he plays with, it's like, it's like you can hear where Zach Wilde got his thing, his berserker vibrato and the pentatonic thing. It was Frank Marino. Frank is just stunning. And uh, I've seen some interviews with Frank where he's very frank about the state of the music industry. And I have to say, uh, he doesn't pull any punches and I love it. And he's kind of right on the money. From the 80s, if I had to give you a super underrated guitar player, I already talked about him. Bruce Bouillet, Racer X uh, is probably uh, the guy who gets overlooked the most. But when you're in a band with Paul Gilbert, I'm sure that is bound to happen. And from the 90s, who can we think of from the 90s who I think is like a mega, mega underrated guitar player? There's a lot of them, actually. Uh, and I'll go with maybe somebody who uh, actually two guitar players who aren't virtuosos or anything like that. But I love the parts they play. And it's both guitar players uh, from Tonic, Emerson Hart and uh, Jeff. It was on the tip of my tongue. Jeff Russo and Emerson Hart from Tonic. Just the way they lay parts and just the kind of... I don't know, their parts grab me in a really emotional way. And then if I had to do an underrated 
modern guitar player, you probably already know about most of them because you're watching YouTube and you're, you're doing the thing. But uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, two players who I think are wicked dudes and wicked players. I want to say Sean Ash. Go and check out Sean's stuff. Amazing melodic shred stuff and he can play a bunch of instruments better than most of us can you know put our shoes on in the morning is phenomenal and uh from australia james norbert ivani he's got a brand new album out which you can go and check out and uh yeah just some of the ideas he has and the way he phrases and the way he melds different styles is actually out of this world amazing amazing guitar player and he's got some great content up on youtube as well that you can all go and check out. All right, that's I think that's it for this week's video. Again, I'm going to be down at the West Australian Guitar Festival in Margaret River this weekend. I've got some fun videos scheduled for the rest of the weekend, especially tomorrow's video. You can find out all about this keyboard. Any questions for next week's video, please put them in the comment section below. The links to support the channel are in the video description. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. Take it easy. I'll see you next time.